Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Landon. And I'm Ben Story. And uh, like she said, we're uh, happy to have you here for our talk on Spark listeners, uh, which is a quick course in how to implement monitoring in your streaming and batch apps. So again, uh, Landon and Ben, we're both data engineers on the big data infrastructure team at SpotX. Uh, I'm going to let Ben kind of give you the pitch on the talk and what the takeaways are going to be. Cool, yeah, we'll tell you about more about Spotix in a moment. Um, but today we're here to talk about uh, building monitoring for your scaled apps. And uh, we know that it can be tough. And if you can relate to this slide, then you're in the right talk. So, um, you know, we, when we were going into our monitoring, we wanted something that was reliable and effective and fast as well. A little bit about SpotX and what we do. SpotX is a global video advertising company. Um, we enable companies to monetize their content using ads, um, so publishers with advertisers who want to market their products and services. Uh, we have a lot of open and private marketplaces, and those allow for lightning fast auctions um, to occur for advertising opportunities. And we work with some of the world's biggest companies. Uh, because of that, we process and store a lot of data every day. Yeah, so we process a lot of data. Um, <laughs> we build a lot of great software internally to do this, and we love open source for that. Um, we're going to focus today's talk on the tech stack that, um, that's relevant to you. Um, we use Spark, Hadoop, Kafka, and the like. We use Hadoop for our distributed storage, um, where we store 220 plus million files, and we're a little bit over eight, uh, eight plus petabytes today across 300 nodes uh, on-prem. We ingest 20 terabytes a day uh, before replication, and our record, uh, record ingestion rate is easily over 100 million per minute. We see thousands of apps on Yarn each day. Um, a lot of those are ad hoc user queries, and a handful of Spark streaming apps that we run 24-7 um, to serve a variety of customers and uh, our application needs. The magic of our system uses Spark streaming pretty heavily. Uh, we need to be able to process billions of records, um, have real-time monitoring with both you know, alerts and visual dashboards, all without sacrificing performance. Sorry. Uh, we wanted a monitoring solution that was fast and easy to integrate and add to, add to any application that our data teams uh, develop. Um, with almost no performance impact, which is important when you're trying to process millions of records in sub-minute batches. So the objective of this talk is how to add monitoring, visual or otherwise, to your application from streaming to batch apps. And we want to equip you with the knowledge and code to go back to your office and get, off the, get a solution off the ground quickly. Uh, in short, we want to remove a lot of the guesswork that we spent a lot of time um, doing for you know, a couple months and we'd like to take that off your, your plate. Uh, we failed a lot, um, and we spent a lot of time you know, discovering the best ways to, to go about this. And that's where Spark listeners come in. To us, there are three common metrics um, we find common across all of our streaming apps. Those are performance, problems, and recovery. Performance metrics include the processing time of each batch, each micro batch, uh, what delays we have in scheduling, and the number of records we process from our streaming data during that batch. Problems include basic logging, uh, you know, failures and exceptions. Those aren't necessarily critical failures or exceptions, but they're something that we want to log that we can keep track of and, and potentially debug. Finally, there's recovery. Uh, most of our streaming applications, well, all of our streaming applications currently run on Kafka, and each message has an offset, which is a number representing its position in the overall stream topic. If we keep track of the maximum offset that we wrote in a given batch, uh, we can know exactly how much data the topic's been processed. This lets us use that information by storing it in a database at the end of a batch. We can then recover an application if that application was to die and pick up right where we left off without any data duplication or loss. Monitoring is awesome. Uh, we love it. It, uh, it can reveal how your app's performing. It can reveal if you have problems or bugs. And it lets you see and correlate um, issues that you might have with your application visually, um, which helps us you know, sometimes correlate it to, to underlying systems going down, um, not necessarily even at the application level that's giving it problems. 
But it can also be really difficult to implement, especially when you're working at scale. Uh, performing even a simple count on a large data set can take a lot longer than you, uh, you have for a given micro batch, especially due to shuffling, and can block the actual work you want to do in your streaming application. Mapping over your data to gather metrics might be required for some special scenarios, but for basic metrics like simple row counts, what you did that batch, um, it can be expensive and add a bunch of unnecessary, unnecessary delays. With that said, here are some examples of how to do monitoring the bad way. Um, the first one is the first one that we did when we were processing um, a large amount of data, which was take your RDDs, run a dot count on it, and run a dot print. Hmm. On the bottom. This is all part of the presentation. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this was totally intentional. I don't know what happened. We should do a presentation on how to do presentations the right way. Did we just lose it? I don't know. I think it's here. Okay, so it's not us. Uh, some reason oh. oh, weird. There we go. There it is. Okay. okay. Let's, uh, let's fix left, that. Go left, yeah. Cool. A little, bit of a little bit of a time buffer for us. <laughs> Whew. All right. Hopefully, I don't mess this up again. <laughs> Back to where we were. Uh, so, the first thing we did was, um, you know, looping over your RDDs to get a count and a dot print. Good deal. Um, that's very slow. Anytime you have any sort of scale of data, anything that's not really small on a given topic. Um, the second one is tracking Kafka offsets. You can get the Kafka offset from a given message, but that requires looping over every single RDD to then get the max. And then also processing time and delays. So you can see in the bottom there, we had, uh, we had some rather um, naive tracking where you start with a system time, execute a task, and it would have to be an action, not a transform. Um, and then you could print out the, the math of that when it's done. But that's not super great, and those resulted, you know, if, if you combine all three of those, those resulted in multiple minutes of, uh, of delays sometimes for a given, you know, sub-minute batch. And that is where Spark listeners come in, and I will let Landon go from here. All right, uh, so this is something that I'm very excited about. It's something that's been a big focus of mine uh, at SpotX over the last couple of years. Um, we needed uh, an appropriate way to scale the the high throughput that we are experiencing in our streaming apps, our auctions, you know, we serve uh, hundreds of millions of auctions a day. Uh, so anytime you watch a video ad, think about you know, the millions of other people that are also watching video ads. Uh, so that's a lot of data. Um, and so we discovered a kind of tucked away trait in the developer API in Spark. It's been around in Spark for a while uh, called streaming listeners, which can extend and, and sort of abstract the basic metrics that we've talked about in the previous slides and the, the normal actions you'd want to take into um, a background operation that Spark is already doing for you. So if you've been developing with Spark for a while, you'll be aware of something called the Spark listener bus, which if you look at the tail of any log, you'll see a bunch of yelling from the Spark listener bus uh, about like dropped executors and things like that. Um, but that tool is actually uh, in the background calculating a bunch of the metrics we've, we've discussed. Um, so if you can tap into these, which will show you an easy way to do that using a listener, uh, you can expose that information for free, write it wherever you want, uh, really do whatever you want with it um, at certain key events in a streaming uh, application's life. Uh, and then that leaves you open to uh, compute special metrics as it relates to your app. So if it's stuff that's in columns within your data, then you'll still have to do that yourself. The listener doesn't have really access to that information um, out of the box. but all the stuff you see in like the job and stage and streaming tab application, or the tabs in the application master, you can have access to for free. Uh, so this is what it looks like in code form. I'm gonna take a brief pause and just let you guys take that slide in. Um, when this talk is over, we'll release these on SlideShare, as well as the code that we show here on GitHub. Uh, the code's actually up on GitHub if you wanna go look. Um, but this is the streaming listener trait comes out of the developer API. Again, it's been in a lot of versions of Spark, so even if you're on an older version, it's still in here. Uh, that package, Org Apache Park's Spark Streaming Scheduler, 
if you uh, extend that trait by creating your own class, uh, your own listener, so to speak, you can override those eight convenience methods, um, which uh, correspond to actions uh, that ha trigger in a, a Spark streaming app's life. So on receiver started, error stopped, so that's, those are executors that are receiving data from something like Kafka. And then on batch submitted, started, and completed. Um, those are our favorite ones and ones we'll go into in this talk um, because they have the most utility uh, in our line of work. Uh, at Spotex specifically. Um, but you can also do um, any custom logic you want when a write happens, so an output operation. Um, we're gonna focus again on on-batch completed, which allows us to, again, if we extend that convenience method, or overwrite it, excuse me, uh, we can implement our own custom logic, we can do whatever we want. We can pass whatever we want to it from our main app, and we have access to what I'm gonna call the holy grail, which is that little argument called batch started. Uh, or batch completed, excuse me. That uh, custom object has all the information we want. It's prepackaged, so when a batch completes, this gets executed and you have access to all the information that's inside of it. Um, again, it, it's hard to showcase this code um, completely conveniently on a, on a screen, but again, it'll be up after this talk so you can go dig deeper. But this is an example of us taking uh, the streaming listener trait from the, the API and extending it to create our own class. We call it the SpotX Spark streaming listener. And we override the convenience method that is interesting to us, which is on batch completed. You'll see that we take a series of arguments for influx in MySQL. That's because we want to write all of our performance metrics to influx and expose those in a visualization tool called Grafana. Um, and if you're not familiar with those, I highly recommend you take a look. Uh, because Influx is a really great, very reliable and stable time series database, which allows you to plot data points uh, over long periods of time and even aggregate them and expose them in uh, convenient visualizations in Grafana, which is a web-based uh, visualization tool. Uh, so again, we um, create the class, extend the listener, uh, the trait from the developer API, and we put whatever logic we want. So if you look in there, in on batch completed, we have two custom functions, uh, one called write batch scheduling stats to influx. We like long methods, so sorry about that. Uh, and then write batch offsets and counts. Uh, we'll dig into what this, this is the kind of holy grail I was talking about earlier. Uh, this on, uh, inside that on batch completed function, you have a batch uh, object called batch completed. We rename it to batch in that slide. But inside of that is a batch info uh, map, and inside of that is uh, a bunch of information that looks uh, a lot like what we described in the previous slides. So the batch time, that's the, the duration, how long that batch ran for. Uh, information on the output, um, like where you wrote data. Uh, and then processing start and end time, uh, submission time, and then of course at the bottom you can see how many records did I process in this batch, if I processed any at all. Uh, what scheduling delay did I introduce to the rest of the pipeline because of my processing time? So did I go over my, my uh, interval window? And total delay, which is uh, how much uh, you know, delay have I already incurred from previous batches along with my own processing time and my own delays. All of that stuff should look familiar from the streaming tab of your application master. So we have access to that, it's pre-computed, it doesn't have to, uh, to do anything, it's just ready to be uh, accessed. So that's what we call the batch info. So again, number of records, processing time, and delays. And the stream information is kind of another uh, holy grail in there, which is our, uh, has topic objects is a topic object for every topic or stream that you consumed in that batch. And that contains the offset ranges that were processed for each partition in each topic, as well as the number of records processed for that topic. So this is a closer look at that class we had earlier. If I back up um, this class right here, so first thing in our, uh, in our class, it looks like this. Again, two, two methods. One to off our performance, or offload our performance metrics to Influx so we can uh, view it in Grafana, and another one to back up our state to something like MySQL. Now you have a lot of options when it comes to uh, offset management in Spark Streaming uh, and Kafka. Uh, you can use Zookeeper, you can use Kafka itself. Um, in our line of work, because we tend to replay data a lot from Kafka and in our streaming apps, it helps for us to just uh, have the security blanket of managing our own offsets. Um, so it might not be for you, and if so, awesome. Uh, for us, we like having that backup uh, and just the flexibility uh, that that entails. So I'll go into how we write those metrics to influx. So it looks like this. I'll let you take that in for a second. 
Again, kind of long, simple, but uh, just a lot. So this is a custom method we wrote. Uh, we pass in that batch object that we got in the uh, overridden method, and we pull out the processing time and the scheduling delay. We do a little math to kind of um, uh, a little security uh, catch for us, and then we pull out the number of records, uh, and then we write those to influx. Uh, we have an internal library that will uh, publish some portion of um, uh, after this talk. It's actually already out there. So like that influx.write, where it's like a one-liner for uh, writing the influx, that'll be published to GitHub, so you can use that yourself if you want to implement that in any of your Scala apps. But yeah, so then we write it to influx, and we expose it in Grafana, and it looks like that. Um, really happy with that. All of our streaming uh, applications, when we build a new one, we copy that template. This is only a portion of it. These are the main points. But you can see that top one is over time records processed. Uh, and every uh, little circle, every point, is a batch completing. So this is an application that runs with a 30 second batch window. Uh, you can see they're processing probably every 20, 15 to 20 seconds. So well within the batch interval, but not necessarily too much. Uh, and you can actually see something interesting if you look toward the right of the graph. You can see a huge spike that correlates across most of the graphs. You can see the records process spike up and fire down. Um, and then you can see a scheduling delay being incurred there. So it's easy for us to tell. And a little bit on the batch processing time, too. Uh, a big jump. So this allows us to see over time that most, most, uh, most of the history of this app, this, schedule, this is over the several hours, this, uh, the, there's no problem with scheduling delays. Records are relatively consistent. Um, and then we have some convenient kind of aggregates on the side, like averages. Um, so that's really great. Again, this is Influx and Grafana. Highly recommend it. So let's move on to the next one, which is how we do our offset recovery. So because we know, or Spark knows what data it exactly processed uh, over the course of a batch, um, again, an offset is, um, I'm not sure if we defined it, an offset is the position of a record in the stream relevant to the beginning of the stream. So start a Kafka topic. I've never been at the birth of a Kafka topic, so I don't know if it actually starts at zero or one, but effectively starts somewhere there. Um, uh, but then you might have you know, records now that are like 796 million, 854. So that'll be the offset number that represents one row in a Kafka stream. Um, so Spark knows this information through the topic object. It knows for each partition in a Kafka topic, because you can have one to n for a Kafka uh, topic, uh, how much, where, what the last offset is we processed. It actually knows every uh, offset. Um, but this can get a little dense, so I'll give you a second. So on batch completed, two custom methods. We've covered the first one. We're digging into the second one. We have two custom methods inside of that that operate on each topic we process. So because you don't necessarily always copy or read one topic in every single batch, um, you might read two, you might need read three, or you maybe just read one. Um, that's what that for each is for. But we will write the offsets for that topic uh, to MySQL, as an example, and then we'll write the count for each topic to influx. Uh, so it's kind of a, a, a neat little combination method. Uh, so let's go into that first one. Looks like this, uh, this is an example. Um, so we've kind of published this so you can use it if you like. You don't have to use MySQL, obviously. You can use whatever you want. But uh, that's something we have conveniently available um, to, as a showcase. Um, so take that custom topic object. You can see in the first few lines that you can access a offset range object, which is a, um, an abstraction um, for access that you can map over for every partition. So the number of objects inside that partition offsets uh, object will be equal to the number of partitions in your Kafka topic. Um, and then you can get the maximum offset um, uh, uh, of each, pardon me, you can get the maximum offset of each partition uh, read from the topic. So this, if we have a topic that has 300 partitions, this will loop through 300 times, grab the last offset it processed, form a convenient uh, insert into SQL statement, and we'll write that to a table called offsets, Kafka.offsets. Uh, and when our app starts back up, uh, we will, it, like for example, so uh, if our app runs for weeks, uh, something happens at a system level and our app dies. Uh, we know that, uh, so if it, regardless of what had a problem, as long as we've offloaded our offsets somewhere safe, we can start up exactly where we left off. Hope that makes sense, because um, we've had that before. It is not uh, as common now, but it's a great security blanket. So that's what it looks like uh, inside of, if you were to do this with MySQL, like a select star from offsets where my app name is, my app one. 
Um, so in this case, we have a Kafka topic called some topic one that has uh, six partitions. And you can also see the maximum offset that it processed, um, the timestamp of that offset from the data stream, and then how many records were in that partition. The last few are mostly for debugging purposes. Uh, really great for understanding what might have happened if something bad happened. I hope that does not happen to you, though. Um, so now that we've uh, written those offsets to MySQL, how do we actually use them on startup? Because you subscribe to a topic, right? Uh, and you just want to, like, in most instances, you subscribe to the latest offsets in a topic. Um, but if we want to make use of our uh, cool recovery security blanket, then we just need to pull those offsets from our state database. So this is kind of an example application that does this. This is a function called subscribe to topic with state. Uh, so you give it a topic. Um, and a uh, uh, method like this is run, uh, where you will select the offsets from, uh, for example, MySQL, and form this topic partition map. So it is a map of the um, partition in a topic to the actual maximum offset, or the starting offset you want to use. Um, so again, it looks like this. I know it's a lot to digest, but just wanted you to kind of get a feel for it. Then, after that, you form a strategy. So this is using an older Spark streaming API. Uh, there, you know, this is not structured streaming. This could be applied to that, but this is an example of what we have in production right now, uh, so to speak. Um, so uh, a strategy, there is this object called a consumer strategies uh, object, uh, part of Kafka, and you can choose to subscribe, which means give me earliest or latest, uh, or you can assign, and that's what we use. So if we get offsets back out of our state database, then we funnel that uh, offsets object that we've built from MySQL and just use it in the assign method. So that tells the stream to not start at the latest point, but to start at exactly the point uh, in every partition for a topic uh, that we want it to. And that, again, gives us the ability to recover, but also the ability to replay. So if we have a business case where we need to reprocess uh, some streaming data, we can do that, as long as you have enough retention in your, uh, in your Kafka topic to, to do that. Uh, and then it just looks like that. So you can do, you know, a create direct stream, um, throw in your strategy that has your offsets in it, and you're done. You're off to the races. So then there's one last function, uh, write topic count to influx. So this is really easy. Uh, not only do we have access to the number of records that happens in every batch, if we process multiple topics, we would want to know how much we were getting out of every topic. So this conveniently gives that to you. So we pull that out of the topic object inside, write that to influx. And that looks like this. So this is an application that has three different streams uh, being consumed at one time. You can see some, like the top two are kind of correlated, uh, bottom one not so much. But that allows us, so if we see um, a spike in batch processing, if we see a spike in one of our, our streams, then we know, oh, it's, the, um, it's not that our, data, our um, streaming app had more data. It is, but like, where did it come from? We can see that it came from that topic. That's just one example. Uh, and then finally, so you've built this Spark streaming listener. Um, you've extended the trait. You've implemented your custom logic. You can do whatever you want with that information. How do you actually use it in your Spark app? Well, conveniently, it's effectively a one-liner. You instantiate your listener that you've built. Uh, give it any arguments if you want it to. It doesn't expect any off the bat, but we've added our influx you know, host name, database measurement, um, and same for MySQL. And then you can call the Spark streaming context function uh, method add streaming listener, pass that in, that's it. And then any convenience methods that you have overridden will be uh, executed, uh, so like when a receiver errors, when, an, when a batch completes, when a batch starts. So you can come up with any kind of logic that you want uh, to make this work. Uh, the possibilities are beyond more, are, are certainly more than what we've described here. There's an example of these on the side directly from the latest Spark docs. But um, the progress listener has the number of waiting batches, the number of receivers in play, um, the last completed batch. So you could put alarming on when the last batch completed and let people know that something is wrong. You can see the number of receivers fluctuating over time. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot there. Um, and we're really, we've really uh, benefited from it a lot. Uh, there is no performance impact, uh, effectively zero. Um, so as long as your logic that uh, you implement doesn't have significant processing delays on top of what Spark already gives you, then uh, you effectively get it for free, which is great. Thanks, Landon. So yeah, um, those were streaming listeners, and those are pretty awesome. 
Um, we love those. So a word about batch listeners. We, um, we use batch listeners as a way to monitor regular Spark applications. Um, those would be ones that we run at a scheduled interval, um, and they run in the, in the more typical Lambda fashion. Um, these are allowed, you know, these are used, we use them to write statistics for runtimes of apps or the, um, you know, information about executors. You can write information about RDD persistence. You can write very granular information. And it helps us uh, do things like find SKU um, and find potential problem nodes. It's pretty similar to the trait that you'd use for streaming. Um, similar to streaming, it's all in a class. It's actually not in a trait, however. It's an abstract class, and you can implement that abstract class, and it has 18 convenience methods for overriding. So there's a few more. It's important to note that you can use a Spark listener in conjunction with a Spark streaming app. There is information that a Spark listener can give you that the streaming listener doesn't have. Um, those are things like when the application started, when the application ended. Um, there's quite a few more there. I know that that is not super easy to see, but there's quite a few more, you know, environment updates, job start, job end, all those things that we find, you know, we, we use. Um, specifically, we like app, the application start and end and the on executor removed. The executor removal gives you a reason that it was removed. Um, we have a lot of production critical applications that are allowed to preempt. Um, in our yarn um, scheduler, and the executor removal um, that, that gives us a way to track it and, uh, and why that's happening. Um, here's a couple examples. So this is kind of similar. Um, there's, again, an influx writer here that um, isn't shown. Uh, that'll be in the, in the gist on GitHub, but this is just a simple batch listener utils class. It extends that Spark listener, and then you're overriding um, the, the two methods that I care about at the moment. Um, we're given that contextual information object, and then we have access to whatever, um, whatever properties that object has. Um, in the case of the Spark listener, it's usually a little less info than the batch info. For example, the, the unexecutor removed basically has when the executor was removed and a string that tells you why it was removed, and that's about it. So yeah, that's, uh, that's what we have. Um, you know, we know monitoring these apps is not easy at scale, but uh, we really like Spark listeners, and we hope that, um, you know, we hope that it helps you um, develop your apps and monitor them um, as they go to production a little easier. And as mentioned, all of this will be available. Um, you can hit up that gist. Um, there's many more classes there, and then there's also a couple um, you know, a couple that, uh, that we really like, those, those example streaming listeners, so, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Let's open up the floor to questions right now. If you have any, please come up to the microphone. Just a quick one. This will all work for structured streaming as well? Uh, you can certainly apply it to structured streaming. Uh, we just don't in this uh, particular example. Okay, so the streaming yeah. listeners are available and such. It should be, right. yeah. Okay. Um, if you happen to try it, let us know how it goes. Okay. We're still kind of uh, moving stuff to structured streaming now, so we're not sure. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Good question here. Um, do you have any automation on the data you're collecting, like on Grafana dashboard? Um, is this just like ad hoc basis? Like what, what do you do with the data? Um, like how what do you do we recover from failure? How do you tell you know, your jobs are failing? Or Yeah, I mean, um, so Grafana has some nice tools as far as like letting us know when things fail. So you can set alarms on metrics within Grafana. So we have PagerDuty pushes us alarms in, in this case um, when apps, applications fail. Um, we have automated scripts that attempt to restart the app if it dies. And then anything other than that, you know, the, whoever's on call is going to go handle that probably. OK. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Hey, um, so I was curious if you can access the stats like during the job or like in the batch context, like knowing whether or not to write it, you know, uh, write like an empty data frame or something like that. Yeah, it depends on the metric. Um, during the job, some of those, I think Landon's going back to it. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, you can, you can talk about it. The, the like um, on output, especially at the bottom. Oh. Oh, we're talking about the batch or streaming? Uh, in batch, but. Got it. Um, oh, in batch. Yeah. Um, uh, so you have access to pretty much, you can override any of those events. So it's mostly when things are started, completed, or error. Um, during 
Probably not so much, um, but you could do, you could, you could maybe make something work, because there is an on other event, so maybe you could look into that. But I mean, there are Thanks. certain things that happen during a batch, like mm -hmm. executor removal or, you know, um, environment changes, those kind of things you have access to during the batch, for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Um, with that many apps and a cluster that big, you must have many, many teams that are involved. And I was curious to hear a little bit more about which teams um, find these stats most useful. Do you, is it both the teams that are writing the apps that are looking at them, or is it primarily the teams running the cluster? Uh, yeah, so um, our infrastructure, we're, we're still somewhat of a smaller company, um, so we have a big data uh, infrastructure and applications team uh, with two kind of focuses between like DevOps and infrastructure and then a traditional software engineering. Um, and then we have a, a very large systems team that's also interested. So it's kind of a joint effort in terms of monitoring our systems and our applications. Systems is more concerned with uh, how things are impacting systems, and we're uh, kind of concerned about both because <laughs> if uh, if for them like you know the application's not running isn't their priority ours is that we need the system so um, primarily it's for us we have two giant screens um, at our pods that showcase and cycle these graphs all day um, and usually we don't need them because things are okay uh, <laughs> but it's really great to be able to see those does that kind of answer your question uh, yeah and does do the people writing the apps use it for tuning their performance as well the use do they use listeners yeah. Uh, so for currently, um, it's mostly just us. Like we use it to um, to offload things that people would try to do in their streaming apps uh, in that listener. So anything that could be offloaded, we try to recommend that. Yeah. Right. But the data teams writing data applications absolutely will use these. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hey guys. Uh, thanks for the talk. Yeah. Uh, I have a kind of kind of specific question. Uh, so I'm curious if you know how to. So I would like to. In the Spark UI, every time you run a, a write job on a data frame, uh, it says the, the amount of records written. Yep. But uh, I, I don't seem to be, to be able to, to get that number in the mm -hmm. code. Uh, probably I can attach to the on job and uh, event, but yeah. I, I was not able. I was curious if you have ever done that. I think, I think the on output operation is what you're looking for. That on should. Output. Even mid batch, at least in streaming, I can't remember on the uh, on the abstract class for batch level apps, but in streaming, and I think in the application at the at the batch level, um, but in a streaming batch level, the on output operation object should have the number of records that that output operation wrote. Okay, awesome. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Hey. Hey. Um, so, if we want to use Spark listeners as a Pi Spark user, uh, is there a nice way to do it, or are we just sad? <laughs> I don't know. I don't actually know. I haven't looked into it. Um, I think Pi Spark is just kind of becoming usable for our teams. The data science team specifically likes it, um, but I don't think anybody has put any time into that. So, I don't know. I'd have to look. Yeah. Okay. You, you can you. certainly look, see if that uh, package exists in the Pi Spark APIs. It's. Uh, yeah, I'll go back to it a little bit here. Uh, that package right there. So um, I, that's what I would do. Um, see if you can find that and see if there is maybe an implementation because it's actually a really short file. They don't actually like really have anything in there. It's like, hey, we put this here for people who want to use it. <laughs> right, and the listener bus is writing all the metrics, so I would assume as long as it's been implemented, it's, it's there for PySpark users. There is another option for you. It's called the Endpoint API. So at the end of every uh, application, there is a, um, you can add slash endpoint slash v1, and you can access those metrics through an HTTP request on your application master. So that might be a good workaround. OK, yep, thank you. You're welcome. Hey guys, excellent talk. Quick question about the, if I heard you guys correctly, you guys are using all on-prem, mm -hmm. is that? that is correct, yep. Are you guys using like a Cloudera or? Yep. Some, yeah, we use Cloudera. Yep. Did you, had you guys considered r plugging into, instead of writing to your, um, the whatever the database was, I don't, I don't recall what it was, uh, had you guys considered r plugging it right into the Cloudera instrumentation so you guys could have all of your instrumentation all in one nice, are you talking about uh, oh, like Cloudera's the Cloudera, time series? The Cloudera series? audit? Yep, exactly. <laughs> Not really. Um, we actually hooked so we actually hooked Grafana up to Cloudera's time series database. Oh, we use Grafana. Yeah, we do it kind of the other yeah. way. Like we built some custom 
graphs in Cloudera, but Grafana is a lot more extensible and allows okay. us to alarm a lot easier. Uh, Follow-up question on that. Did that work okay for you guys, going the other way around where you plug in Cloudera data? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's yeah. a data source connector for Grafana that I think Cloudera provides, and we yep. plugged awesome. it in, and you, every query you can run in Cloudera Manager, you can drop into Grafana. Yep. Cool. Thanks, guys. Absolutely. Is that it? Cool. Um, cool. If you guys want, feel free to check out our blog. It's called Hadoopsters.dev. Uh, it's a thing we've been running for years. Um, also, there is a uh, just GitHub where we have those implementations. We have an example template that has um, just the information implemented without the MySQL and Influx stuff. So if you just want to hit the ground running, you can use either of those. And if you want, send us an email or you know hit us up on LinkedIn and we'll uh, talk about stuff. Yep. So, thanks. Thanks, everybody. Bye.